Rachel, you should be all set. Great. Thank you, John. So good evening, everyone, and happy new year. I call to order the policy committee meeting on Monday, January 9th at 6.03 p.m. So welcome. Our first policy this evening to review and discuss is RPS policy 5141.21. This is the administering of medications. First for an overview, Public Act 22-80 has made changes that affect Connecticut General Statutes 10-212A, which addresses the administration of medication in schools. Public Act 22-80 allows school nurses or in their absence, qualified school employees to maintain and administer opioid antagonists on an emergency basis and without prior written authorization to students experiencing opioid-related drug overdoses. The newly revised policy contains a revised optional section E regarding the administration of opioid antagonists. The section reflects the new law's requirements. The revision also offers language to include parental refusal of the administering of an opioid antagonist in an emergency situation. Shimon and Goodwin have also revised this policy to provide additional clarity around the use of continuous blood glucose monitors in school. The law requires that the board review its administration of medications policy biennially and to seek the advice and approval of the school medical advisor, if any, or other qualified licensed physician and the school nurse supervisor with respect to policy changes. With that said, I warmly welcome Mr. Aaron Grook tonight to our meeting. It was back in November that I sent Dr. De Silva a note about the requirement to review by our medical staff. And I wanna thank Dr. De Silva and Mr. Crook for helping us in our due diligence as our committee this evening in reviewing this policy. So the first five pages of the policy are definitions. The purpose of this policy covers terms, general policies of administering medication, diabetic students, epinephrine for purposes of an emergency, an optional section E, which we'll review this evening, documenting and recording and record keeping, errors, emergency procedures, supervision, training, handling storage and disposal, and a school readiness programs before or after school programs. So if the committee um, sees fit, I would like to start on page 15 of the policy that is the section E optional updated language for opioid antagonists. So Mr. Crook, would you like to perhaps um, lead us through this section or even just provide your medical advice on this topic at this time? Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here this evening. Um, opioid antagonists are medications that have a stronger affinity to the opioid receptor than the opioid itself, which is why it's a highly effective medication at reversing an opioid overdose. The problem with opioids <clears throat> is that the person who uses them experiences a sense of euphoria and it depresses the urge to breathe. <clears throat> so the respiratory reflex is diminished. Um, when that happens, <clears throat> a person will simply stop breathing and it's a very subtle thing. It's nothing dramatic, um, so, which is the reason the opioids are so dangerous. So we, Ridgefield Public Schools, have had a standing order <clears throat> for naloxone or Narcan, which is the opioid antagonist medication, for several years now. It's actually, I'm proud to say, the very first thing that I did when I started, when I joined RPS six years ago, um, because we recognized um, the importance of having this in the schools. Um, it's also good to note that our all of our school resource officers carry it uh, the opioid antagonist Narcan on them as well. So we're well stocked throughout the district. Each nurse's office has two doses of the antagonist um, to be given. They've all been trained on the administration. <clears throat> and we've also trained an administrator in each building on the administration of the opioid antagonist. Our standing order was written um, by myself in cooperation with our medical advisor, Dr. James Ahern. And it calls for the administration of Narcan in the event of a suspected opioid overdose. So if a nurse or an administrator finds a student and they don't know whether that person has had an opioid overdose, but they have symptoms of the opioid overdose, the Narcan is to be given because it's an otherwise benign medication 
that will actually not cause any negative medical side effects um, if that person had not been taking opioids. It's a completely safe medication to take. Um, our protocol also calls for immediately calling 911 <clears throat> anytime the uh, medication would be administered, simply because um, some long-acting opiates may stay in the bloodstream longer than the Narcan has an affinity to the receptor. So there's always that risk of a, of a, an overdose after the fact. <clears throat> so it's a, it's a medical emergency anytime this medication is given and uh, the student or staff member or parent or spec spectator or whomever it was uh, given to uh, would be taken to the emergency room to be evaluated by all the physicians in that environment. So um, I just wanna congratulate the board on considering this policy. I think it's really excellent, it's important. Unfortunately, there have been some students who have perished from opioid overdoses in the Connecticut schools within the last several years. Um, obviously, it's a pertinent and important thing um, that we bring to RPS. Thank you so much, Mr. Crook. We really appreciate your medical advice on this. Um, so it sounds like this is a best practice that's going on currently, and now we're, we're writing it down. Correct. Um, okay. Any questions from policy committee? Divya? So this is going to be in all nine buildings? Yes, it has been already in all nine buildings um, for several years. We've already had it in place. And only the nurses are trained to... Um... No, that actually changed this year. Aaron, you trained an additional staff member, an administrator in each of the buildings. Am I correct? Yes, we went with the Western Connecticut Coalition Against Substance Abuse, who has a training a module, a training class prepared. And we had an administrator from each building participate in that training. So we, in addition to the school nurses in each building, we also have an administrator in each building who has been trained. Including central office. Yes. So in the event the person who's trained is out, do we have a replacement or a substitute who's also trained? So it'd be the nurse and or the administrator in the building that's been trained. Okay. So we and don't have to back up if both are out. Okay. We also have our school resource officers who are trained and also keep Narcan on them at all times. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions at this time? Okay. And I think this part of the policy, it also establishes regular school hours so that this would be available during regular school hours and not after school is, would that be correct, Mr. Crook, that it's not for after school programs? Yeah, the way this policy language is suggested by Shipman, it does say that. Um, if it was after school hours and the nurse happened to be there or the administrator happened to be there, they would certainly not be precluded from administering this medication. Um, but I believe having uh, read the policy, it does say that 911 call would be um, the protocol at that time. So um, yeah, you would always default to 911 if there wasn't somebody that was trained or comfortable providing the medication. Okay, thank you so much. Yes. It establishes the regular school hours. It defines for us in here an opioid antagonist. It talks about the school nurse and consultation with our medical advisor shall determine the supply needed. It talks about safe storage. It talks about providing notice to parents and guardians. It talks about administering the medication and the training to become a qualified employee to administer. Um, it also talks about no qualified employee, call 911. Um, parents may submit in writing a refusal of the emergency medication and the board shall annually notify parents and guardians. Are there any other questions on this section before moving forward? If I may, um, Ms. Ruggieri, Aaron, am I correct in saying that that is an added piece to the student information system that parents would then um, click, let's say, agreement to at the start of the school year? Yes, uh, we're working with the technology actually right now to add that language to PowerSchool um, when parents register their students at the beginning of the year to alert them not only to their um, option of opting out of a Narcan administration, but also EpiPen administration. Um, I don't anticipate that we'll have large numbers of parents opting out, um, perhaps even zero, um, but it is the law. Thank you. 
Um, if okay at this time, I would like to go to section C update, which is on page 11. This is diabetic students. So this is Shipman and Goodwin have revised this policy here again to provide additional clarity around blood glucose monitors. Are there any questions from committee on this section? So are all the teachers, I mean, at least the teachers who are handling that specific child are aware, are they made aware of the situation because the child of the blood sugar level is gonna drop, they need assistance. Erin, can you speak to the training that our teachers receive with respect to, I'm not sure if you heard Divya's question. But... Yes. Okay. I did. Um, thank you for the question. So there's a great new technology on the market that's come out within the last couple of years called a continuous blood glucose, a CGM, continuous glucose monitoring. And they are able to <clears throat> Bluetooth connect to a student's uh, iPhone that um, uh, pretty much all of our diabetic students carry one on them. And then that connects to an iPad in the nurse's office. So now that the school nurse is able to continuously monitor the blood sugar of the student, um, even from before they get on the bus in the morning, while they're on the bus ride, once they enter the building, um, they can continuously see what that blood, blood sugar is at. So the school nurse uh, consults with the teacher throughout the day as needed. Oftentimes, you know, as the students become more independent, as they get older in the grade levels, um, they'll be monitoring their own blood glucose as well. And then they'll come and coordinate, speak with the school nurse, determine if they need a dose of insulin, if they need to have a little bit of glucose, uh, glucose tablet or drink a juice or something like that. Um, so the teachers are kept in the loop, but the, the great thing about this system is it actually takes a little bit of the burden off of the classroom teacher and they can kind of continue focusing on the teaching that they're doing and the teaching and learning in the classroom environment because the nurse is able to truly monitor this um, very tightly. So when you say the nurse is monitoring, is the nurse going to come and pull the child out outside of the class and... Um, so we, we always try to minimize disruptions to children in classrooms whenever possible, but one scenario that may happen is the nurse may just kind of stand at the classroom door, the diabetic student kind of eyeballs and sees them there and might walk up to the nurse and just say, here, have this box of juice and it, and that's it. And the student goes back to their seat, drinks a box of juice, and it's a very non-disruptive, um, thing that happens. Okay. And is the student allowed to bring their own, because if they have allergies or you know, some specific condition, are they allowed to bring and keep um, supplies in the classroom? For yes, them? yes, there's policy in place that students are, uh, diabetic students, uh, there's no, there's no um, <clears throat> way to preclude them from checking their own blood glucose at any time and place that they want to. They're allowed and encouraged to carry a supply of glucose on them at all times. Um, many of them will carry a fanny pack or a backpack. <clears throat> um, and like I said, as they get older uh, throughout the grade levels, uh, many of them become much more independent in managing their own diabetes. And the role of the nurse kind of shifts to be someone who's controlling everything to somebody who's really supporting that student and learning to manage their own illness. And from a broader perspective, not specific to diabetics, but any child who has a medical condition that needs a plan at school um, goes through what's called a, a individual healthcare plan process, as well as a referral to section 504 for accommodations at school so that their quote plan, whatever their intervention is, is codified appropriately. And then they are case managed for that plan by the nurse and or a combination of somebody else, could be a school counselor, could be a school psychologist, so that, um, that this information is clear, is documented, and those who need to be trained are appropriately trained. Sometimes that can include conversations with people like the, um, you know, the, the cafeteria, staff or um, even, you know, your uh, lunch recess paras, people like that. So not specifically just for diabetics, but so that that information doesn't just live with that one person, that one nurse who happens to know all of it. It's actually our next policy, 5141.25 talks about the individual health care plans. Mm -hmm. um, and again, that goes for any student who has an allergy or reaction and that way there, there is something very specific to the student that is followed by every classroom teacher, essentials teacher, et cetera. So that information does trickle down, correct? Oh yes. It trickles down to every single 
you know, administrator in the building. Yes, and it's also, there's a designation for it in power school. So for students who have multiple teachers go across multiple settings, there's one common location um, to make sure that there's an alert on that student profile that they have an individual healthcare plan. Um, and the nurse and whoever the case manager is for the 504 plan are responsible as case managers to every year, make sure that those who um, need to know the contents of it are notified. Thank you. Okay, great. Great questions, Divya. Thank you. Um, so what I would like to do since this policy has not been reviewed since 2015, and we should be reviewing it every two years, and it is in the last section of this policy as well that we should be reviewing it every two years, I'm going to start a list. Um, so if policy members or if anyone sees a policy that should be reviewed annually or biannually, um, please let us know and, and we'll create that running list because um, it's important that we are in compliance with our policies. So for the public, there's a lot of language in here that hasn't changed, but I think it would be good to just start at the beginning. So again, the first five pages are terms that go with this policy. If you look on page five, you will notice um, language that has been highlighted. And throughout the policy, you'll notice a lot of language that has been highlighted. This is language that has been omitted in our current policy because of possible updates since 2015. So for instance, on page five, I, we had the word self-administration, but we didn't have possession self-administration or possession and self-administration. So I just wanted to make that note. Okay, um, moving forward, page six, again, current language hasn't changed. Talks about the school nurse assessing competency for self-administration. It talks about students diagnosed for asthma and carrying an inhaler. Um, page seven, again, updated language made since 2015. Again, not in our current policy. On page eight, you will see a whole section E highlighted. Um, again, this has been an update since 2015. Um, the language in this section E is slightly different than the language in section D. So I thought we would just review it. Um, in section D, it's on page seven, section D. It says, a student diagnosed with an allergic condition. E says, a student with a medically diagnosed life-threatening allergic condition. So it is it is slightly different. The shipment of good one has them as two separate paragraphs. Are there any questions up to this point? So when it says self-administer, is there a specific age from which the students are allowed to do it? So I think um, to your question, great question, Divya. I think it says the parent or guardian of the student has provided written authorization for the student to possess self-administer or possess and self-administer such medication. So it would have to come with parent or guardian approval. Also a qualified medical professional has provided a written order for the possession self-administration or possession and self-administration. So we wouldn't want to rely on the student who may not be able to administer it independently without the parent and the medical provider assuring us that that's okay. And there's no specific age limit for it? Where a it age specific? Um, I don't think that there is. Aaron, do you know that there is? Uh, I'm sorry, specification regarding what? An age, um, an age requirement. <clears throat> yeah, I'm not aware of an age requirement. Like you had said, as long as there's a medical order and a parent permission, um, I haven't seen anything uh, requiring, you know, saying a kindergartner could not administer themselves an EpiPen. And I think the reason for that um, is that, you know, um, EpiPens save lives. And I think it's very important um, that they're available uh, whenever possible. Thank you. Thank you. Um, on page nine, it talks about trained paraprofessionals in the administration of medication. This is all current language. Page 10 talks about anti-epileptic medication. Um, page 11, we spoke about diabetic students. Um, if we could skip to page 13, this is section D, epinephrine, for purposes of an emergency first aid without prior authorization. Again, this is current language. I just wanted to 
for the community transparency that it's in here. And I did hear that we would be putting this in PowerSchool as well as the optional section E language. Um, if you move to page 14, six and seven on page 14 is the parent or guardian notification that they have refused emergency administration of the epinephrine. So that language is included in our current policy. 15 is the optional section E. Um, if we could move towards page 20. Page 20, this is documentation and record keeping. Again, I just want the public to know that this is in our policy. This is our current language. Um, on page 22, we talk about errors in medication administration. So that is also covered in this policy. Page 23 covers the notification of the principal superintendent of a medication emergency. Um, on page 24, you will also see more highlighted language. Um, this was language that was not included in our current policy, but perhaps over the years has been revised since 2015. Any questions up till this point? So the documentation, uh, it's either written in ink or it's maintained electronically, correct? It's maintained Ele electronically. Yes, electronically. We have a proprietary uh, medical um, electronic medical record that the nurses have access to to record any medication administration. So is this reviewed every year? Right, there's an annual review meeting on a yearly basis um, that includes the parents, the nurse, school administrator, classroom teacher, and anybody else relevant. And then a case manager is assigned, could be a nurse, could be another staff member. And so upon every new school year, the case manager is responsible for, and this is very pro forma, for notifying relevant school staff. Um, in some cases, that also includes um, training. Um, and at times, we'll invite the parent in to participate with the training with the group if it's appropriate. So the past records are still available for? Yes. Mm -hmm. they're, they're maintained electronically. Thank you. Great question. Um, so on page 26, on page 26, it talks about annually completing. Oh, yeah, one sec, Selena had oh, a question. Sorry. Go, ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry, Selena. Um, I can't find my post-it note, but I had a, a post-it note earlier and, and now I'm not, <laughs> sorry, I'm late traffic. Um, do you, anti, it's usually referred to as anti-seizure medication now. I, I, and I posted a note at, with a question mark. Is it, are you still calling it anti-epileptic medication? Because some people have seizures, but they don't have epilepsy. Mm -hmm. In the policy, was it written? Right, and I, I can't, I think one place it was, and now I can't find my- It's place. on page 10. So page 10, section H, it says, a principal teacher, licensed athletic trainer, licensed physical or occupational therapist employed by the board, coach or school paraprofessional, provided medication is anti-epileptic medication um, there. It's talking about um, with a student with a medically diagnosed epileptic condition. But shouldn't that be anti-seizure medication because some people do take seizure medication who aren't diagnosed with epilepsy? But Aaron, it's did followed you hear with the oh, sorry. individual seizure action plan, student individual. So does that cover that? <clears throat> In that age, if you say Aaron, did you hear that question? Yes, I did. <clears throat> I think it's a relevant question. Um, <clears throat> maybe that uh, slipped through the fingers of Shipman. I'm not sure. But if the board felt that they wanted to change that language, I would be in support of it. So page 10, um, it says anti-epileptic. And Selena's making the recommendation that it say anti-seizure. So from a medical perspective, Aaron, you have no concerns over that change? Not whatsoever. Okay, we could would absolutely add that in then. Thank you, Selena. Selena, is that the only spot in which you saw it? I can't find my post it notes. I looked through <laughs> we'll, this earlier. We'll I'm so we'll sorry. We'll do a search and find I was it. rushing. Yeah. I, I, be, I believe that's the only place um, that the anti epileptic term comes up, but I could definitely do a find through the document as well. Thank you. No problem. 
So um, moving on then guys, if, if that's okay, page 26. Um, so this is annually completing a training program in regards to section E. So if we're considering section E, we would definitely want this section in here about the training. Um, the next page, so is about bus drivers. So we do not employ our own bus drivers. However, are there any questions around this section? Um, actually, Rachel, there is a small group that we do employ with our van drivers. So those individuals, Aaron is in the process of training. And as we hire more over time, we'll continue to do that in-house training here. Okay, so we would include then this section, Dr. De Silva? Yes. Okay. And Aaron has already reached out to look to schedule that with our current drivers. Beautiful. Thank you, Mr. Crook. You're welcome. <laughs> um, on the next page, this talks about handling storage and disposal of medication. Any questions on this page? Okay, I, I actually, I had one. <laughs> so for number one, as I was reading it through, and I think, I think you actually already answered my question here, Mr. Cook, on this one, um, because I was wondering sections D and E in our language only allow for emergency use during school hours. Is this part of the policy allowing usage during intramural and interscholastic events for first aid, if the parents or guardians or other responsible adult give that medication to the nurse or the coach? Yes, co uh, coaches and qualified school employees are able to provide an inhaled medication if the nurse determines that self-administration is not a viable option. Um, there's also a specific diabetic medication that's an injectable that coaches are allowed to be trained in receiving. Um, so yes, for... Um, intramural sports, um, it is allowed. Thank you so much. <clears throat> um, and then just the last thing again, um, it's the last page of this policy. Again, I'll be making a running list of policies that need to be reviewed annually or every two years. Again, it's definitely important that we keep them up with compliance um, and make sure that they're reviewed accordingly. Are there any other questions on this policy before moving forward? Okay, so this policy then will move forward for first Hang reading. On one sec, Rachel. Rachel. Karen has a, a comment. Just, a oh, sorry. Go ahead, Karen. That's sorry. Okay. Just a quick uh, clerical edit. Uh, the sure. term professional is now paraeducator. Oh, I will make that change paraeducator. Thank you, Karen. Okay, great. So this will move forward to the full board for our first read. Thank you, everyone. So our next policy up for review this evening is RPS policy 5141.25. This is food allergies, glycogen storage disease, and or diabetes. Shipman and Goodwin have revised this policy to provide additional clarity around the use of continuous blood glucose monitors in school. So in front of you, you have the RPS current version in blue, as well as the Shipman and Goodwin updated version. The recommendation would be to keep our current version and to include the updates in blue that appear in the revised copy. Why? Because if you look at the revised version, three paragraphs down, first sentence, so that's the revised version, three paragraphs down, first sentence, it says, students with life-threatening food allergies and diabetes are virtually always students with disabilities and should be referred to a section 504 team. In our current policy, three paragraphs down, first sentence, it reads, students with life-threatening food allergies and diabetes should be referred to a section 504 team, which will make a final determination concerning the student's eligibility for services under section 504. So now in a prior policy committee, a lot of time was spent editing this sentence. 
I do feel that our current language reflects RPS values and practice, but I wanted to see if there were any questions from the committee on this sentence. Okay, cool. Um, so let's go then to page four of the revised version in regards to the update. Are there any questions um, around the training or education in the revised update? Okay, beautiful, thank you guys. So this will move forward then for our first read. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Aaron, I think you're good. Are we all set, Rachel? We can let Aaron. Yes, thank you so much, Mr. Krupp. Really appreciate it. My pleasure to be of service. Have a great evening. You thank too. You. So our next policy up for discussion is RPS policy 6172. Point three. So first, I want to thank the community members who have shared feedback on this policy. We did not move this policy forward last time to the full board for first read, because in partnership, we wanted to have more discussion around the notice to homeschool a child. Also, during the time since our last meeting, we did seek out legal counsel. And as a result, the recommended policy in front of the committee today comes with council's recommendation and review. I thought it would be pertinent to start with some legal references as background to this policy. Would that be okay with policy members? Okay, thank you. So the first is the Connecticut State Department of Education suggested guidelines. So on November 7th, 1990, the State Board of Education adopted a policy on home instruction. Suggested procedures were developed in order to assist parents and local boards of education to work together to ensure children receive the education they are entitled to by law. Following these suggested procedures, as per the Connecticut State Department of Education policy on home instruction, would satisfy compliance with Connecticut General Statute 10-184 and 10-220. So as a reminder, 10-184 is the duties of parents, school attendance, age requirements. It talks about a child to attend a public school regularly during the hours and terms. It also says, or the parent or person having control of such child is able to show that the child is elsewhere receiving equivalent instruction in the studies taught in the public schools. Section 10-220 is the duties of the boards of education. It says, shall cause each child five years of age and over and under 18 years of age, who is not a high school graduate and is living in the school district to attend school in accordance with the provisions of section 10 dash 184. So if parents wish to educate their child in the home, they must show equivalent instruction as per section 10 dash 184 and local boards of education must determine whether or not such child is receiving the equivalent instruction as per 10 dash 220. As per the suggested guidance, the notice of intent would satisfy these Connecticut general statutes. There's also something else. There's a research report from the Office of Legislative Research State Law regarding homeschooling students in other states. In the state of Connecticut, it lists, is it authorized in the statute? Yes, under the equivalent instruction exemption, but the statute does not explicitly name homeschooling. Is there a notification for parents before homeschooling? It is not required, but the law exempts students from compulsory attendance if the parent shows that the child is receiving equivalent instruction elsewhere. The State Board of Education guidelines recommend parents file the notice of intent to homeschool with local boards of education. The guidelines are not a legal requirement. However, in checking with counsel and review, 
we can take those suggested guidelines from the Connecticut State Department of Education and use them as a form of best practice and set as our district, district policy around homeschooling. Before going any further, are there any questions? Divya? Yes, Bob. Fantastic. Fantastic, Thank Rachel. Thank you. Thank you, Selena. Divya? So the, the contention with those parents who sent us those mm -hmm. <laughs> emails was must file, correct? So it says parents must file. I know it's a guideline, it's a recommendation, mm -hmm. but is this for students who are already enrolled with the school district? We are saying you must file if you're leaving the school. So if, stu right. so if students um, between the ages of seven and 17, if those parents elect to homeschool their children, online school their children, however, then they must file a letter telling us what they're doing with their child because otherwise we're going to perceive that student as being truant. So it's as simple as that really is ultimately they can homeschool their children and educate them as they see fit. We may not agree on the effectiveness of that program. And ultimately, you know, if we have concerns about how that child is educated, we have measures on which we can take. But the most important piece is that we know where that child is, right? Because if they're not with us, then our goal is to have them educated somewhere. Um, and so whether the child is being going to a private school, being homeschooled, going to school, ski school and going online, we just need to know. So once they're out of the school system and they're being homeschooled, do they still have to do it every year? Do they have to file or is, don't you think it's at that point we don't need it? Um, so I, I would argue that we do. Um, because things can change. And so what we'd like to know is that things are, and also I, at the end of the day, we're here to help. Uh, we're a public school. We understand parents and families make their choices. Every parent and family is entitled to that, but we're here to help. And so if the child is struggling with a particular area, we'd like to be able to offer at least some support, some resources that they could go to. Um, and we wanna make sure that the, nothing has changed with the, with the child or with the family. And so our goal would be to have them come annually to let us know how things are going, to review their portfolio. If there's any concerns, we can guide them. If they don't, again, it still goes back to if we have a concern and we don't know where a child is being educated, we might consider them as truant. Not sure whether this answers the question. All of the emails. That, that's okay. You want so. Mm -hmm. We are stating that only kids who are going to go out of the system, correct, the school district, right. the ones who were never part of the school district, they're moving from out of town, they were homeschooled. Right, we don't know that if they were exactly. never in the school district, we wouldn't know that. Okay. And that in of itself brings on a challenge, right? We have children that are living in the community that, again, we would love to be able to, to support that family in any way possible. We're a public school. We offer a free and public education. We think we do an amazing job here in Ridgefield. Of course, we'd like them here, but ultimately if a parent chooses otherwise, and that's okay too, then at least just let us know. And let's see if there's some, some way that we can guide you and, and support. And most of the time when families come to meet with us, it's a good productive mm -hmm. conversation. We're not here to sway you one way or another. We're here to let you know what we offer as a school system. Doesn't work for you, your family. The, at this moment in time, sometimes it changes, yeah. but if it doesn't, then, then that's fine. And so it's just a recommendation, it's not a must. It says must file. No, a, a parent must file with the superintendent of schools a notice of intent if they're not educating their child. Okay. If they elect not to, um, then we ultimately might believe that that child is true because we don't know where they are, right? And so whether they file a formal notice of intent, they email the school, they come visit the school and put it on a piece of paper, I plan on homeschooling the child, we will certainly reach out from our office to say, hey, we're here. If you'd like to come in, let's meet and let's... Let's see what we can do to guide you, bless you, guide you along that way. Mostly that conversation is helping them find all the resources from the state that are free, that kids can um, lean into, classes that they can take. The state has a whole big website that's a little bit difficult to navigate. So usually that's what the conversations are like. I've met with all the families and then also um, the year-to-year -year families when they're thinking about perhaps coming back 
for ninth grade or perhaps coming back for sixth grade. I just make sure that they have everything they need to transition to know about placement, to make sure that they have um, kept track of what standards they're teaching to, if they're having any issues or troubles. Um, we can reach out to other people in the community. So really it's always, in my experience, it's been a supportive conversation. So Divi, I think um, your question is, is one that most people would have, right? Because it says must, but right above it, it says suggestion. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, and as Rachel described, we have the right as a district to create a policy that says you must do A, B, or C. Ultimately, a parent has a choice not to do that. But between those ages, we are going to, if we know that a child exists, we are going to, to find out why they're not in school. And if we can't find out, we're going to assume that they're truant and not being educated, which is likely not the case, right? It's just families choosing an alternative. So we as a district have the right to create a policy that says the word must. We're using the language right from the state that is in some ways very confusing because the State Department of Ed is saying these are the suggested procedures. And then within there, there's a word that says must, right? Suggested and must don't line because up, Rachel, which is why you're asking and, you know, recommendations and then yes. over here it says must. And Correct. Then right and at the bottom, it says, um, it says children educated at home are considered to be non-public school students. We don't have jurisdiction over them. Right? That's correct. So the mandatory purpose of the intent form goes away if they're non-public school students. So this is so many layers over here. Right, so, so the reality is what we do have an obligation or a responsibility um, to do as educators is if we know that there is a student who is out there, who is not being educated by us and we don't know how they're educated, between that age gap, we have a responsibility to find out where that child is, right? And how they're being educated. Once the parent lets that us know, it could perhaps not be a program that we would recommend and we don't necessarily even think it's effective, but they've let us know. We know that the child is being homeschooled. That's their notice of intent. Um, in my opinion, it's a small requirement from the part of a parent, right? To say, hey, this is what I'm, I'm doing with little Johnny. But if, if we don't know that, we're going to assume, right? That that child is not being educated and we have a responsibility to educate all students between that age period. And so we do have the right to create a policy that represents the values of our district and a parent, ultimately, if they choose not to do this, and we're made aware that there is a student, it's not, we don't know what they're doing. We don't know that they're in a private school. We don't know that they're being homeschooled. We don't know where they are. We're going to, we're going to file a truancy report and follow the obligations or the responsibilities that we have in terms of educational neglect, if that's what we believe might be happening. Okay. Right. Usually, really, when a when a parent removes a student, there's a whole process with the with the registrar. There's a withdrawal form, so it would just be a second form. It's actually one page, very very simple. So it's just the same as letting us know practically that you're going to a private school. It's just what's your intent? What do you plan on doing? Well, this is where the child's going to be. Okay. We may not agree with it. I'm not <laughs> saying that we would necessarily. You know, it could be that they're not getting enough science or they're not getting enough math. We we're not really, uh, we don't have that much authority over what the education mm. looks like, mm. but where we do have a responsibility is to know where our children are being, the children in the community that we serve are being educated. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for your questions. Um, are there going now to the recommended policy in front of us, um, Divya, you've brought up some really great questions with the language here. Are there any other questions with the recommended language? Okay. Also, I just want to point out, I think we should, that last sentence where it says children educated at home, we need to just highlight in blue from enrolled on because some of the language did shift a little bit in that sentence. Um, if you remember, this sentence is in regards to the other part of our conversation that we had on athletics and the eligibility of homeschooling, of homeschool students. So interestingly enough, Rachel, and I apologize because I only caught this now. Sometimes it happens just when we're in a meeting. I wonder if we should clarify the language. Um, it's not just children educated at home, right? They're children that are not, they could be in a, a private school setting as well. 
So they're non-public school employees. So um, I wonder if we can add an and or there, children educated at home and or not registered or and or in a um, private parochial setting are not are not considered to be not, you know, are not considered to be public school students and therefore. Yeah. Children educated outside of the school district. There you well, go. So it's, it says in the CIAC, um, not extended to any student whose program is not under the direct supervision right. of a CIAC mm -hmm. member school. So it's, it does lump in both of those groups. So anyone who's not under the supervision of the Let's school. See. So that would be a homeschool kid a school in any kind of private or parochial school. Because they're likely not to be part of an, a CIAC group because right. they have their own athletic divisions. Um, unless they're um, under the umbrella of the school district would include students who are privately placed through their IEP. So right. those students are eligible, so uh, but that's because, because they do not have their own their program CIAC is, membership. Their program is under the direct supervision of a member school. Right. So they, yeah, right. So, so that's why they are, they that are group eligible. would be under yes. and then the mm -hmm. other groups. So you have to be under the direct supervision of a CIAC member school. Right. So direct supervision means they're supervising your programming, which you right. would right. not be doing for, as we just said, we're not supervising homeschooling programming at all. That's not under our jurisdiction, yeah. right? Just right. like private schooling mm -hmm. or a parochial schooling does not, is not under us. But if we had a student who is, is that out please? Maybe yeah, they some kind of program, the IEP. Pri mm -hmm. privately placed through an IEP. That's mm -hmm. because of us. So they're under. They're still, it's a Ridgefield IEP. They're so still they're Ridgefield public school students. They're fixed. still right. registered Sorry. with us. So, um, Rachel, I know that got a little messy there for a second. But, uh, <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> yeah. It's smart it leads, right? Chaos theory, and then you get to the right <laughs> no, Children no. educated at home. Mm -hmm. Or children educated outside of the outside of the Ridgefield school public district. right outside of the school district no because they're still students part of are not Ridgefield public school students yeah that's because it. our students on IEPs are still students children at, okay, educated at home or non-Ridgefield public school students ah, right are considered to be non-public school students and on right okay the other the other critical piece which I don't think is appropriate for this policy in terms of language, but just by way of reference, students who are withdrawn, students who have IEPs who are withdrawn for homeschooling, parents then give up their IDEA rights, their procedural safeguard rights and all rights related to their identification as students with disabilities within the public school setting. And so that notification to the district that they are now homeschooled triggers my office to immediately contact parents to make sure they know that becoming a homeschool student then means that they cease those rights. And, and so giving them that notice legally is very important for all, our office as well. So from you know multiple vantage points, and that's not a lot of students, but it happens every single year. And so there are parents who I end up having conversations with every year because of the letter we send out, because we get notified by Corey's office that somebody's being homeschooled, where parents wanna understand more about their child's rights as a homeschool student. So that is covered in a different policy, correct? Whatever. Um, so well, IDEA covers but, public right. school students. And so, so if you're no longer a public school student. So yeah. by default, they would be a no. We don't have a policy, but by default, because IDEA mm -hmm. only covers public school children. Right. So if your child goes to a private school and they elect in their, they have an IEP, they elect to go there, they no longer receive funding through IDEA. They can get a 504, but not IDEA. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. So if this policy will move forward with um, the respected revisions uh, as presented here today for first read. Uh, just as a reminder to the community, we recommend policies here at the policy committee meeting to the full board, um, but then there's a first and a second read before approval. I want to thank Selena and Divya, um, Dr. Silva, Dr. Hannaway, uh, Ms. Gillette, uh, Ms. Dewing and Mr. Crook tonight for all of their um, participation. I really appreciate it. Are there any other questions before we adjourn? Okay, well, uh, motion to adjourn. Divya, second. Selena.
Okay, I'll see you all in a few. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Rachel.